Good morning. Excellent. It's really good to be with you this morning. It's uh, nice to be here. For those of you that don't know, I am actually one of the pastors of the church here. But most of my time is spent looking after a church uh, down in South London. Um, I'm particularly pleased to hear for to two reasons today. One is to see all you lovely people. And the second, I don't have to spend two and a half hours driving home afterwards. So, um, in fact, it was two and three quarter hours uh, last week, which included a very pleasant 20 minute stop parked, stuck in traffic outside Harrods in Knightsbridge, which looks absolutely pretty, except if you want to go home. So it's, um, it's nearly Christmas. Uh, Warren's been taking us through uh, the Christmas story. And uh, last week looked at the last part of Luke's Gospel with you. Last part of uh, chapter one, sorry, of Luke's Gospel with you. So um, I just want to see how much you learnt last week. So, so what were some of the key things? By the way, if, if you're not familiar with me preaching, I, I ask lots of questions and I um, listen to the answers as well. So I wonder, what were some of the... Who was here last week? About four of you. I'm slightly suspicious, particularly as Warren wasn't here last week and I thought he was preaching. So oh, let's try that again. Who was here last week? Oh, we're in double figures now. Fantastic. What were some of the key things that you learned from last week? Because I wasn't here, so it just helps me. What were some of the key things you learned last week? I'm really glad you're here, John. So what were some of the key things you learned last week? Well, we, we were talking about the fact that um, being, being silent for so long meant that I've, I've forgotten his name. That's Zachariah. Zachariah. meant that Zachariah had to do a lot of listening, and we were talking about how much listening we actually do. Fantastic. I preached on that passage last week, actually. Yeah, in somewhere else. Anything else that we learned last week? The other key things? That Elizabeth and Mary were able to chat about the babies in, that was within them. Okay. Okay. I understand occasionally you, you have an angelic visitor t tips, tips up at some point during the sermons. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Did Clarence, that well-known biblical character, Clarence. So did Clarence come last week? Did, did he make a helpful contribution last week? What, what did you learn from Clarence last week? Anybody else? Hannah, I'm really glad you're here. That Clarence made us know that the way things were done in, in heaven is quite different from the way we do things here. So that hopefully we'll get it as, it's, as he explained to us last week. Okay, thank you. All right, well, let's continue with the story. We're beginning at uh, the start of Luke chapter 2 and working through to verse 20. It's a story that's really familiar to us. Um, but I want us to try and hear afresh from God this morning. Sometimes when, when we're with something that's familiar, we, we forget. You know, God's Word is a living Word. It's, it's not like studying some physics textbook or some maths textbook or, or something else. It is God's living Word. And, and so because of that, each time that we engage with it, even parts that are very familiar to us, God can speak to us out of it. Amen? So as we look at this familiar passage this morning, let's expect God to speak into our lives. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their ancestral towns to register for this census. Now, Caesar Augustus became ruler of the Roman world in around 27 BC. And uh, the purpose of this census was to, it was a regular um, event, and it was to sort out poll tax, basically, and to sort out military conscription. So they knew exactly who they had, who had to pay how much, and also who had to serve in the army. Although the, the Jews were exempt from serving in the army, but everyone else had to do their military service. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He travelled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. 
He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. There's some real irony hidden just under the surface here. Because Augustus, the Roman emperor, believed he was God. He was divine. And, and he believed that he was running the world. In, in fact, probably running the entire universe. Because after all, he's God, he thought. And yet, here's God, the real God, ordering events to get Jesus born where it was prophesied he would be born. Because the emperor, who thought he was running the universe, said everyone's got to go back to their original place. Isn't that amazing? I just, just find as we come into the story, just amazing. We, we forget sometimes just how big and powerful our God is. So here we've got this event just being organized by God, even though Emperor Augustus thought he was running the universe. Here he is just doing God's will. Amazing, isn't it? I find that amazing anyway. And they placed him, the baby Jesus, in a manger. Now, in homes at that time, um, the, the way the home was, typical home was constructed is that the family lived and slept upstairs, and downstairs was where the animals lived. And there was nowhere at all for Mary and Joseph to go. They ended up in this stable, this area where the animals lived. We'll come back to that a little bit later on. A couple of weeks ago, I was uh, visiting um, two of my grandchildren, and their mum said to us, there's an open-air nativity taking place in the center of the village. Would you like to go? Now, I'd never been to anything like that, so I thought, this is a great opportunity. So Leslie and I and two of our grandkids went off to this open-air nativity. And there were over, I didn't do a precise head count, but there were over 500 people there. I mean, it was just loads, crowds and crowds of people. It's an annual event which the, the church, the very strong, clearly Bible-believing church in the center of this village, actually run each year. And um, we, we started off uh, on, the, on the village, village green, a huge, great village green. And uh, there was the, um, I assume he was the rector, uh, giving some narration, telling some of the story. And... Uh, and then walking into the crowd, with the crowd having to part around them, comes Mary, Joseph, and a donkey. And they just very slowly just walk their way through the crowd and come and a bit more of the stories told. And, and, and then it's time for them to go and look for somewhere to stay. Now, just around, just opposite the, uh, the, the village green is a hotel. So they go off to this hotel. We're not allowed to cross the road. It's the other side of the road, but the, the marshals stop all the traffic, and they go across to this. And, and you see them there looking for accommodation, and, and they're just they're turned away. And, and so they then walk further down the road, and there's another hotel that's um, a bit further down. So we all follow. It probably took us 10 minutes um, walking very slowly because... Very heavily pregnant ladies and donkeys both seem to walk very, very slowly. So we walk down to this next inn. And there's a big party going on in there. And there's lots of music. And um, there's obviously a big Christmas social going on. And lots of people inside, you know, with Christmas hats and, and all of that stuff going on inside. Completely oblivious to what's going on outside. And... Mary and Joseph and Donkey arrive at this second hotel. And they're turned away. 
And a bit further over on the green, there is this stable that's been built out in, in the green with some straw, with an animal feeding trough, and the donkey. Oh, there were shepherds and all of that as well, but that, that, I, this, I, I found this emotionally hugely moving. I, you know, I've read the story more times than probably most of you have ever done. I preached on it loads and loads of times. But there was something about seeing this couple in real life with this real donkey going to these places where you'd expect welcome and being turned away. It was a cold night, by the way. I mean, it was, it was cold. And so there they are, sitting out on the green, on a few bales of straw, with a feeding trough. And then the baby appeared. I don't know quite how that happened, but all of a sudden there's a baby. And it's a real baby, not, not a doll, real baby. Suddenly they're sitting there, and I didn't see that bit. But the, but, <laughs> but the real baby appears, and they're sitting there. And, and it really brought home to me, just the, again, something of the reality of Jesus being born into our world. This is, this is real world stuff. This is not a fairy story. This is, this is real stuff that happened. And just as we were walking down the road, following them, going from one place to another, looking for somewhere to stay, here is the Son of God, the creator and sustainer of the entire universe, with this poor couple, homeless, Nowhere for them to go. You know, God could have quite easily arranged for some nice, fancy accommodation in a nice, nice place. But God so loved the world that he sent his son to be as one of us. Born there in Bethlehem. So the story goes on. That night, there were shepherds standing in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all the people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will find him by this sign. You'll find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven, peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. It is hugely striking that the only people to whom this birth was announced in the locality, I know there were some wise men, you know, three years walk away, but the only people in the locality who were told about this birth were the shepherds. Now, I don't know how much you know about shepherds in the time of Jesus. But they were despised. They, they had very low social standing. I mean, it was, it was just about the bottom of the economic pile. It's what the despised people did. You know, shepherds were so despised, they weren't even allowed to give evidence in court. Because they were considered so untrustworthy that no one believed what they said. No, did you hear that? They, they were considered so untrustworthy that no one believed what a shepherd said. They weren't allowed to be witnesses in court. So who does God send the angels to? The shepherds. Isn't that extraordinary? So we've got two extraordinary things already. We've got Jesus being born in a stable. Nowhere for the couple to go. And then you've got the announcement being made 
to shepherds. If, if Jesus was being born in Greenford tomorrow morning, who do you think the angels would announce his birth to? Here. We haven't got any shepherds, so you're going to have to think. Who do you think he would announce? Who do you think here they would announce the birth to? What do you think? I thought homeless people. Mm -hmm. Homeless people? Any other thoughts? Prisoners. Prisoners, yeah. Any other thoughts? And maybe people with like addiction problems. People with addiction problems. So it's an extraordinary thing, isn't it? I mean, just just imagine that that Jesus, born in Greenford, tomorrow morning, and it's not the clever people. It's not the important people. It's the people that. No one else notices. It's the people that no one else would believe that the angels sent by God announce the birth to. And, and they are invited. Here's the thing. They are invited to be the first witnesses to the birth. Isn't that extraordinary? What does that tell us about God? What does that tell us about God? Yeah, status doesn't matter. Status doesn't matter. Yeah. I think it's even more than that, actually. Yeah. That he, he loves men regardless of what, who they are, what they are, what color they are. He doesn't care. Yes. Even more than that. Absolutely. But there's more. What else? Yeah. Because he's special. Because he's special. Yeah. Special. What else? He, he cares for those who are um, suffering most. He has, he has, God has this, you know, this, you see, the, so you're pointing somewhere else. Ah, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. This is my wife, by the way, so I need to be very careful. It's like he turns it upside down. He turns it upside down. Uh, and, and this isn't the only time. I and mean, we, we find that in some of Jesus' parables as well uh, later on. God has a heart for the people at the bottom of the pile. That's where he starts. That's who he brings the good news to. The people who are those that would be overlooked by other people are precisely the people that he goes to. Which is, which is you know, Steve's... Slight mishap this morning, why well, it's in a sense quite amusing, because it was the tax collectors. Now, the tax collectors were despised. They were despised because they were people who were working with the occupying army. They collected money on behalf of the occupying force. So they were despised, and so on and so on. And that's who God has a heart and a passion We'll, we'll come back to the shepherds a little bit later on in, in the story this morning. Just a few side notes here. The fact that the shepherds were out on the hills means that, uh, and, and what they were doing, they were with the sheep and they guarded the sheep against thieves and they guarded the sheep against wild animals. It actually means that Jesus was born not on the 25th of December. I'm I'm, I'm sorry. It was actually at some point between April and November. That's when he was born. Some point between April and November. Because it was too cold otherwise to be out on the hill with the sheep. So, I'm, I'm sorry. I do like the carol in the bleak midwinter. It's got some nice bits in it. But not the bleak midwinter bit. That's, that's I'm afraid, wrong. So, you might, be, you might like to know how we ended up with the 25th of December being the day that we celebrate Jesus' birth. Well, in around the year 400, the emperor, uh, the Roman emperor, um, he became a Christian. 
So he wanted to sort of like Christianize the Roman Empire, and which was pretty pagan. So he wanted to get away from the pagan festivals. And there was this big pagan festival called Saturnalia, which took place, can you guess when it was? 25th of December, well spotted. And uh, he thought, let's get rid of that and let's replace it with something else that's Christian. So that's when we'll celebrate the birth of Jesus. And do you know what they used to do on the, on the, uh, the how the, the, um, the, the festival of Saturnalia was celebrated? Do you know what they used to do? They used to give gifts to each other. Oh, I wonder how that happened. We don't know much about what angels look like either. I, I, I know that, I mean, the angels that, that tipped up at uh, the nativity that I talked about earlier on, you know, your standard white, um, white cloth um, with some great pyrotechnics around, by the way. I mean, it was, it, was, it was really, really good. These exploding fireworks and all of that, flares going off and lit all these angels up. Very spectacular. But we don't know much about them. But what we do know is that the word that we have, angel, actually it's a Greek word, which, as you will know, the New Testament was, was written in. And they were actually messengers, so that the word angel literally means messenger. And, and it's someone sent by God to explain something. I mean, how would, how would you know otherwise that a baby sitting in a cattle feeding trough is actually the Messiah? You know, you need an angel, don't you, really, to come along and give a little bit of explanation of what's going on here. Which brings me back to the feeding trough. One of the things that really irritates me, uh, there are lots of things. I'm, I'm, someone called me Victor Meldrew the other day. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? But one of the things that irritates me is, is the way that we... Be careful. One of the things that, ir that, that irritates me is, is the way that we sanitize the Christmas story. You know, going back to that, that, that green, you know, it was very clean hay. And it was a very, 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 very nice manger. Freshly made, freshly tidied up and cleaned. And it wasn't smelly. When you go into a place where animals live, it's smelly. It's dirty. You know, animals, you know, they tend to go to the toilet where they are. You get the thing here? And, and have, you ever, have you ever closely looked at a trough that cattle feed out of? Have you, have you ever, ever inspected one? Well, well, have a look next time you're somewhere where there's some cattle. Um, have you ever watched cattle feeding? There's almost as much comes out of their mouth that goes in. I mean, it's just disgusting. So this, this feeding trough will be covered with animal slobber and probably some stuff from the other end as well because they don't mind where they go. Do you, you know what I mean? So, so this is an unsanitary, smelly, disgusting context. And this is where God, the creator and sustainer of the entire universe, chose to send his son to be born. To be as one of us. To live his life among us. Such is God's love. Such is God wanting to identify so closely with us as human beings. And the angel's message, in fact, almost, I think, there may be one or two exceptions, but nearly whenever an angel turns up, the first thing they say is, Absolutely. Don't be afraid. Be joyful because God has sent the Messiah. God has sent Christ, who is Savior, into our world. Now, with all the Christmas tree and stuff, we can sometimes forget why it was that Jesus came. Because he came as Savior, which implies he came to. Save us from something. 
So what did he come to save us from? Just a quick reminder. Sins of the world. Okay, what's a sin? Something you do bad. Something we do bad before God. So he came to save us from the consequences, from, from the punishment for the things that in God's sight we've done that are bad. Absolutely right. That's why he came. And as Steve said earlier on, there is this close connection. The reason that he came was to die. These two events, the birth and the death, are actually part of the same event. And then the angels talked about peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. Peace on earth for those with whom God is pleased. What does that mean? We sing it a lot, don't we, at Christmas? We talk about peace. When I've been writing emails in the last week or two, nearly all my emails have says at the beginning or the end, I hope you have a peace-filled Christmas. So what does that mean in this context? When the angels say, peace to all those. So what's peace about? Not a trick question. But I just want us to think about what it means a bit. Is the, um, your conscience cleansed before God? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's peace of having a, a rest with God. So we're not worried about the things that we've done wrong because we found forgiveness. So there is that, that cleansing from God. Yeah. What else? Having no conflicts. Having no conflict? Yeah, maybe. That's a part of it. I think there's a, it's a little bit more than that as well. That's Hannah? Also, a piece that um, makes, even though there's turbulence or conflict within you or within there is that peace that says it's okay because it's in control. That's the kind of peace. Okay. So, so peace doesn't mean that we don't have any difficulties. Peace is actually knowing God's presence also in those difficulties. <laughs> knowing God's peace, God's presence right in the heart and center. Because uh, life is full of difficulty, isn't it? Am I the only one who thinks that? One or two nods, yeah. Life, there are difficulties in life. And because you're a Christian doesn't mean there aren't any difficulties. There still are difficulties. But in that, because we know who God is and we know what God is like and we know that God's heart is for us, there is a sense of peace and confidence and trust in God. So we come to the end of the story, or the part we're looking at today. The story hasn't finished, but the part we're looking at today. So, verse 15. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the, child had, sorry, what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they'd heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. So I want to finish looking at three different responses that we find in those verses to these events. So all who heard it in verse 18 were... Astonished. So let's try and put that in Greenford context. So we've already imagined a little bit about Jesus being born in Greenford tomorrow and who the angels might go to. So let's just imagine that that's happened and the homeless, the addicts, the prisoners... They've come along, they've visited, they've gone off, they've told people about what they've seen, and people that heard it are amazed. So what does that actually mean? 
does it mean in practice for those amazed people? Say again. Telling the story. Hmm. Yeah, the shepherds told the story. I'm thinking about those amazed people. What does it mean in practice? What difference does it make to them, do you think? Excuse me. Well, it, it all depends on their response, whether they believe it or not. So some of them might just dismiss it as a flight of fancy. Others might think, mm, maybe it's true, so I'll go and do a bit more digging and find out for myself. So, Because you can be amazed and it makes absolutely no difference to your life at all. Can't it? Wow, that's amazing. What's for dinner? Yeah? And I, and I think in this story here, that's one of those responses. Wow! Angels, shepherds, baby in a feeding trough. Whoa, that's amazing. What's for dinner? Second response. Mary's response in verse 19. Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. So what does that response mean today? What does that look like? Mary kept these things in her heart and she thought about them often. What does that mean? I'm really glad you're here this morning, Hannah. <laughs> I feel like talking. Uh, it means, uh, for me, I think, Mary probably think, God has said this, when is it going to happen? I don't know how I'm going to react when it happens. Okay, so she's turning things over, thinking about it, yeah? Anything else? <laughs> Sorry again. <laughs> Maybe she used what was told to her to help her through the difficult times, to give her faith and peace and hope. Okay, so she's part of it, just holding on to, holding on to that, yeah? I think trusting in God, whatever's going to happen, just trust him all the time, just depend on him. Yeah. So there's this process with, with Mary, she's, I, I think perhaps a phrase that I would use is that she's trying to understand what's going on. I mean... It is a little bit mind-blowing. She was probably a teenager, um, perhaps a young teenager, in fact. Uh, could go into other reasons why we think that's the case, but she's almost certainly a teenager, probably a young teenager. So she's pregnant without having sex, thanks to the activity of the Holy Spirit, and being visited by an angel, and now she's given birth, and she's in a stable, and um, you know, smelly animals, feeding trough, and pile of shepherds turn up saying we've seen angels and and this is this is the messiah that's promised to the people of god to the jews i don't think she would have slept much that night for a whole range of reasons but one of those reasons would actually have been just turning this over no matter what what it is that's happening here i mean god had spoken to her an angel had appeared to her but what does all this mean? What is the significance of this? So it's, it's about seeking understanding. And finally, the shepherds. Verse 17. After seeing him, they told everyone what had happened. And in verse 20. They went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they'd heard and seen. So what does that mean? today. So what would that mean for the homeless people, the addicts, the prisoners, after they've left visiting Jesus in Greenford tomorrow? What does that mean for them, that, that response? What's that like? What does it mean in practice for today? Gives them hope that there is a, a, a God and he's, he's willing to be involved in your life. Okay, gives them hope. What else? See these hands moving, the ladies doing their hair. I thought they were actually going to uh, say something. 
If I see Timmy's hand go up, of course, I know that he's not doing his hair. But um, uh, do you want to help me out here? What do you think is happening with these shepherds, Timmy? Someone trust us. Say again? Someone trust us. Okay, so part of their response is, actually, we aren't insignificant. We actually matter. God really did speak to us. It wasn't a practical joke. This is real. There is a God in heaven, and he cares about us. And boy, are we going to tell everybody the story. You know, the shepherds, homeless, drug addicts, prisoners, the shepherds in this part of the story are the only people doing what God says for them to do. Their response is a response of belief and it's a response of obedience. They're giving all the glory and honor to God. They're not saying, whoa, aren't we special people? Wow, look at us. We're the ones God chose. They're saying, isn't God amazing? Isn't he awesome? Isn't what he's done just incredible? Oh, by the way, um, you, you should know what God has done. The Savior, he's been born. He's been born. We've seen him. Everyone they see. They don't care that people think that they're shepherds and so they're not fit to speak about. They're not fit to be witnesses to the truth. They don't care. Everyone they see. It's amazing what God has done. Jesus has been born. We've seen him. The Savior is here. So as we come to the end of this bit this morning, there are are four things for me that, that jump out of this story today. If you... Ask me on another occasion, they may well be different things, but four things today. One is the way that God is at work even when we don't recognize it. One of the things you would have, I'm sure Warren would have made the point last time with the story of <clears throat> Zachariah and Elizabeth. These, they've been praying for years. They didn't realize that God had heard their prayer. <laughs> God's at work even when we don't see it. God is there at work, even when we're not aware of it. Secondly, God cares about those whom society does not value. Those people at the bottom of the pile, God cares about them. God cares about them. He has a heart and passion for them. He turns the value system of our society upside down. God's been accused of being biased to the poor. And I think that's a fair accusation. Because I think it's true. God is biased to the poor. Thirdly, the Savior has come. The Savior has come. And he's bringing peace into our world. He brought peace all those years ago. And that peace is still on offer today. Peace into people's lives. Peace into people's circumstances. But finally, you know, being amazed is not enough. Being amazed at what God has done is not enough. We need to be people who actually respond to God. Who do what he asks. Who take those steps. Who are obedient to him. Let's be quiet for a moment. You've been listening to me for long enough. I'm going to stop talking. And uh, just a few moments of silence for you to think. And if it's appropriate for you to talk to God.
Steve's going to come and lead us in a moment. Um, <clears throat> we're going to sing a carol now, and it's it's a carol that's got a huge amount of meaning in it, and it's one that's really familiar, and uh, you probably know the words off by heart. But I I want to just pull out some of those words. It's it's the carol once in royal David City. Stood a lowly cattle shed, mother laid her baby. And uh, verse 2 talks about he came down from earth to heaven. God and Lord of all. His shelter was a stable. His cradle was a stall. And then there is the response part. First his to God. He would honor and obey. And then he's our pattern. He was weak, helpless. He understands our sadness. He understands our gladness. And there'll come a day when our eyes at last will see him through his own redeeming love for that child so dear and gentle is our Lord in heaven above. And that may not be the carol that we were going to sing next, so I hope that's all right. Frank, can we cope with that? Thank you very much indeed. Once in Royal David City, if you're able to, please stand. It might even appear on the screen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.